Hey, you. Yeah, you. You listening to this video right now that's probably wondering why I'm talking like this. I wanted to let you know, don't tell anyone else, but I wanted to let you know that you can actually listen to One Sock Radio on a multitude of different streaming sites. That's right. You like Spotify. That's the only example I ever give, but you like Spotify. I guarantee you, you will find One Sock Radio on Spotify. But what are the other places you can find One Sock Radio on? Well, that's very funny you ask, because you can find out at a simple link, anchor.fm forward slash one dash sock, all lowercase, and you can find all the locations you can find One Sock Radio on. You can also listen to One Sock Radio there on anchor.fm. And now, to listen to a goofball who isn't whispering into a microphone like it's ASMR, I will let you get to the episode. I hope you enjoy it, because I certainly did. Dear Evan Hansen is a musical with book by Stephen Levinson, with music and lyrics by Benj Pasek and Justin Paul. Copyright is reserved by these names. The Dear Evan Hansen script is published by Theater Communications Group. Attention! The following podcast has references of suicide and parental grieving. If you may be sensitive to these topics, please change the podcast now. Thank you, and enjoy. Before this episode begins, I would like to remind the audience that this is purely my interpretation of the show Dear Evan Hansen, and it is completely possible you can come to different conclusions or read different things between the lines. Again, this is a script analysis. Conclusions built on evidence from the script obtained through thorough investigation. And, as art is incredibly subjective, different people can see different things from the evidence. Spoiler warning. Cynthia Murphy, a tragic story of depression and loss. Losing a child, finding them, and learning it was all a lie. A feeling we can't come close to understand. Yet, she has the most positive view of Connor than the rest of her family. Hello, and welcome to One Sock Radio. I am your host, Cody Novotny. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is time for a little chat. Sit back and relax. How about that? Make some breakfast and a cup of joe. Take some sips and on we'll go. Enjoy! Like I said in the last episode, Heidi and Cynthia are both very similar. It's obvious that it was intended to show how parents of high schoolers go through very similar problems, both of which know that their kids are struggling and attempt to help out in whatever way they can. Cynthia is going to be another case where David Ball's backwards reading technique won't work. If you're just tuning in, I described this technique in detail in episode 2, Insecurely Me. I believe the important part to understanding Cynthia is looking at how she talks to Connor in scene 1, how she grieves in scene 4, and exactly what she did to try and help him while he was alive. Through her interactions in scene one, we learn a lot about her relationship with her family. For one, her bond with Larry isn't strong. She actively asks him to say something about Connor going to school and when he mildly attempts, she criticizes him. And later in the final scene of the show, Zoe says that Cynthia lets Connor get away with a lot of stuff. We can see this from her reaction to Zoe and Connor exchanging strong expletives to each other when Cynthia bogs down on Zoe, but not on Connor, who instigated the insult. This will be brought up again later. And after attempting to defend Connor about his substance usage, she turns around and accuses him after not getting confirmation from him. From this scene forward, we don't get to see how Cynthia interacts with Connor only from context clues describing previous actions, a term used to describe events that occur before the beginning of the play. So when we move forward, we will be calling back to this scene to confirm statements said about Cynthia to check if they are plausibly true. I believe another big thing to look at about Cynthia is how she grieves Connor in scene four. 
This scene is gut-wrenching in the show. Nothing hurts more than to see a parent go through something like this. It's important to see how she reacts when hearing that Connor didn't write the letter. She starts begging Evan to tell her anything about Connor. She reaches for something to latch onto that will make the story true. That Connor left something behind. I can speak from experience here that when you are mourning like this, any tiny thing is a sign. And that is exactly what happens when she seeks Connor's signature on Evan's cast. For her, that is the only bit of evidence she needed. She was desperate for truth, for closure, for a source of stories. And I believe this is more of what she wanted. Stories that will revive Connor in her heart. Something that will give her answers. In the final scene of the show, we learn that Cynthia and Larry both knew about Connor having some kind of struggle. Cynthia, from what I understand of the scene, was the most active in trying to get him help, which is questioned heavily. Was she trying to help too much? As Larry put it, she was always sending Connor to some new place for help. Through my interpretation of his phrasing, he thought of it as damaging for Connor. And another character take is that Cynthia never punished Connor. We can certainly see this through that one interaction in scene one where Connor insulted Zoe, who later retorted, and Cynthia ended up scolding her instead of him. Most of what we learn about what Cynthia was like before Connor's death is through what other characters say about her. And our primary source of information is Zoe. We learn through her that the Murphys are rich and Cynthia is a stay-at-home mom who hops between different beliefs, concepts, and diets. She, herself, can't stick to one thing. This has a huge connection to how she is constantly sending Connor to different rehabs and therapists. Through this little quirk, Cynthia can't be satisfied with one thing. She needs constant evolving and expanding ideas, which leads us to Evan's situation. Already, it is difficult to find any semblance of closure after a suicide that didn't have a note. But for someone like Cynthia, it practically drives her insane. She isn't aware she is doing it, but during scene six of act one, she is feeding Evan information practically helping him tell the story he is making up off the cuff. She treasures the emails, always wanting more, never questioning it at any point. Not even when the email's compositions don't match Connor's characteristics. She doesn't need Evan to prove anything to her. All she needs is for Evan to give her more information and she will prove it to herself. I mean, naturally. Who'd expect someone to lie about something like this? Which leads us to her reaction when Evan finally tells her the truth. She's the most in denial. She hangs on to the truth. But when the fantasy of the emails fades away along with that day at the orchard, she falls. I couldn't even come close to fathoming what it would be like to learn that this image of your child's personal life was a lie. Everything you thought you knew wasn't real. And you're back to knowing nothing about your kid. It's crazy and it's painful, but it was necessary. I know I said we don't ask what could have been, but in this instance, it is imperative to understanding the ending. Look at what state of mind Cynthia was in in scene 4 act 1. She was reaching for information, something that would tell her anything. If Evan was never involved, I heavily doubt if Cynthia would have been in her state of healing that Zoe describes in the last moments of the show. Despite the lies Evan tells, he still reminded them of the orchard which was a source of a lot of real good family memories of Connor. And not only that, he also helped set up a campaign to raise money to rebuild that same orchard. The same orchard that the Murphys now use as a picnic spot that Zoe explained that helped mend their marriage. 
So, how does Cynthia tie into the main action of Dear Evan Hansen? Despite the pain she feels, Cynthia is the first of the Murphys to be at peace with Connor's passing. Or at least, that is the lie she tells herself. Cynthia begs for a sign, an answer. Then Evan's name appears in the letter. Then Connor becomes more centric in her life than ever. She quite literally doesn't stop thinking about him at this point. Talking about him, reading about him, creating this illusion for herself that he is still alive. The emails, the stories Evan tells, it brings him back to life for her. And that isn't being at peace. She specifically says that she won't sing a requiem because she no longer believes he is dead. She believes that he is still here. That is the most glaring piece of evidence I can give. The real healing, the real moving on, the real peace, is when Cynthia and Larry begin having picnics at the orchard. As Zoe puts it, it saves them. They have a sapling in this new orchard. They grow and become something new. The dead and despair of the old orchard is gone. A new one is growing. It is of health and color. A new beginning for an old place. I wanted to talk about the orchard and what it represented in a different episode, but it felt right to touch on it a little here. But one question still sits awkwardly in the pits of everyone's stomach, of those who know this show. Why didn't Cynthia and Larry reveal the truth about the letter? Well, first, we need to talk about Larry. Which we will do in the next episode. I apologize for this one being a little shorter, but before I leave, you are valid whether you like the show or not. Just remember, ask the wise, don't criticize. Have a good one. Your company was just swell. I hope you enjoyed our little prey. Please have a good morning and a wonderful rest of your day. One Sock Radio is self-produced with readings, script, and music by me, Cody Novotny.